Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss, again, aniline oligomer. Recall that we can define at least three distinct oxidation states for these oligo or polyanilines. In this video, what we want to look at is the emeraldine base oxidation state, but when we modify the end uh, moieties of our oligomer in such a way as to bind to uh, divalent metal ions. So that's what we're going to look at in this particular video. Here we see a 3D optimized geometry of such a modified oligoaniline. So instead of using aniline for the outer ring, we use anthranilic acid, which has a uh, carboxylic acid group that is ortho to the amine. And it's these two particular functionalities, the carboxyl groups and the amine, that we're going to use as ligands for divalent metal ion. If we start with an oligomer made from anthranilic acid, we notice that we have a carboxyl group that is ortho to the amine group. Each of those provides an attachment point for the uh, Lewis bases, the ligands, to bind to the divalent metal ion. And if we have two of these, one at each end, then the charges on the metal ion are plus two, the charges on the ligands are minus two. So we end up with a neutral cross linking in that case. And here we have a kind of a quick sketch showing the cross-linking um, of the two oligomers by the uh, plus two metal ion, showing that effectively we have um, uh, a tetradentate ligand here. Now, we may or may not have additional water molecules to move it up to octahedral coordination or not, depending upon the case. And here we have a sketch of the idealized version of the cross-linking showing the uh, four points of attachment. This may be tetrahedral, it could be square planar, it could be tetragonal, or it could be octahedral depending upon the particular uh, divalent metal ion that we're looking at. For all of the transition metal ions, we pick the plus two ones so that we would end up with a neutral cross-linking. So for if we have manganese plus two, it is a D5 metal. So at the left-hand side, we see that if we have the high spin octahedral uh, conformation. On the right-hand side, we see the low spin octahedral. And because we have um, degenerate orbitals, T2G, that have different numbers of electrons, we end up getting a Jan Teller distortion for the low spin octahedral case for manganese plus two. Now, to determine the actual electronic magnetic environment, what we do is we measure the samples in both a magnetic field and outside of a magnetic field by seeing the difference in forces involved. Uh, that's going to be proportional to the number of unpaired electrons, and then we can calculate. In the case of manganese 2 plus, it turns out that is experimentally a high spin octahedral uh, conformation. 
And here we have a computer calculation of that particular situation. Notice that we have two of the positions uh, of the octahedral coordination come from uh, water molecules that are the solid. The second metal we tested was iron 2 plus, which is a Z6 metal. So on the left hand side, we have the high spin octahedral with a Yon color distortion. On the right hand side, we have the low spin octahedral. Experimentally, there turned out to be no unpaired electrons, so it is definitely low spin, strong field um, octahedral. And here we have a uh, representation of a computer calculation of this situation, which is the one we found experimental. Again, notice that we have water molecules forming two of the octahedral positions. The third metal we tried was cobalt 2 plus. Cobalt 2 plus is widely used in models of uh, novel metalloporphyrin systems like hemoglobin and myoglobin. So it can be either high spin or low speed octahedral because we have a D7 metal. So that's one complication. It can also be tetrahedral. So, uh, in we have D7 tetrahedral, there's no difference between high spin and low spin. Experimental results confirm that this forms a tetrahedral uh, coordination. So here we have a uh, visual depiction of a computer calculation of exactly this type of cross-linking uh, involving cobalt 2 plus. We also tried nickel 2 plus, which is a D8 metal. Nickel is complicated in that it tends to be high spin in octahedral environments, which we see on the left hand side. So that's the uh, electronic configuration that's most common for nickel 2 plus. But it also very commonly forms square planar complexes where it is going to be, have a, um, it's going to be low spin. So it has a spin of zero. Experimental results confirm that the uh, cross-linking is high-spin octahedral. So notice we have two of the octahedral positions are formed by uh, solvent molecules of water here for nickel 2 plus. Our final two metals are relatively easy to summarize. In that copper 2 plus is D9 and it forms a uh, tetragonally distorted uh, transition metal complexes. And then zinc 2 plus is always D10. It's always going to be low spin and tetrahedral. So here we have a visualization of a calculation involving the uh, tetragonally distorted uh, copper 2 plus. And if you look at the distances uh, from the metal to ligand, you can see the tetragonal distortion is rather substantial.
And here is a calculation of cross-linking involving zinc. which as we expect from biochemical examples is going to be a low spin tetrahedral complex all of the time. And then to sum up, we have a chart here. And in the second column, the mean, we're listing the average number of unpaired electrons and then followed by the standard deviation and then to far right we have our conclusion as to the geometry of the divalent metal ion um, when it's uh, complex to the uh, aniline oligomers with the anthranilic acid uh, functionalities on each end. So in summary, you notice that, for example, the uh, manganese 2 plus is a high spin octahedral. The iron 2 plus is low spin, so it has uh, no unpaired electrons. Um, we see a similar situation for zinc 2 plus. We know that it's going to be tetrahedral. It's going to have no unpaired electrons. So those in particular are a very nice uh, test of our experimental methods to show that it gave uh, the expected answer for a situation where we already knew what the magnetic state was going to be. Also, we're able to show that the there was a nice correspondence between the results of our calculation using density functional theory and our experimental uh, results that we did from doing the actual experiments with the different metals. So I thank you very much for your kind attention. Stay healthy, stay safe, and as always, have a good one.